Hey guys, I guess I actually hadn't started. Um, so, sorry I'm a little bit late, had some technical difficulties. So, yep, yeah, it's been a while since I've done this. Think about it, it's been a month and a half. Um, welcome back, good to see everybody. I see Stu's in here, I see John's in here. Um, tonight we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite flies. So I call it my Kroger fly. Hey Rick. Um, sorry, I'm gonna actually run this. I just need to do one thing, guys. I'm trying to be able to get everything set up. But I'm going to be tying up what I call my Kroger fly. Pretty simple pattern, and I'm going to actually start out by kind of talking about where I came up with it and kind of how I fish it, how, what I fish it on, and all that. So kind of the story of this one really comes from back in the forum days. Um, if anybody remembers what that's like, I uh, remember before Facebook, before social media. Um, that was the social media of the time. So had a guy who's fishing middle, middle bed, let's just call it that, killing him, and asked him, you know, hey man, what are you fishing with? You know, I'm getting my butt kicked. What am I, you know, what are you doing differently than me? He's a cagey dude. He's a good buddy of mine now, but he was a pretty cagey one. He literally typed out a description of this fly. And we'll go over it in a few minutes on how to tie it. Is this what he is this what he was fishing? I don't really know, honestly. Um, it's kind of a funny story on that one. That I have no idea if that's really what he fished, but I know that that's what you know we caught. I know that's what I caught fish on. So with this fly, um, it's a quick and dirty pattern because kind of designed it for the middle bay. Found it works really well all along the coast. It is a shrimp pattern. It's what it looks like. Um, and when we're tying it, I'll show you kind of what makes it kind of a little bit more shrimpy. But it's a fly that's designed to be quick and dirty for a couple of reasons. One, I like quick and dirty. You know, two, this fly's lifespan, typically for me, is no more than about 10 to 15 minutes where I'm oftentimes casting it. So I'm tying a lot of them with the intent of them not living forever. So no matter what we do, it's not intended to live for a long time. It's kind of intended to be, you know, live for a few minutes, get hung up in a rock, get hung up in a, you know, on a dock, get hung up on something. So this thing is being fish tight to cover. And Middle Bay especially, where I kind of first used it, we dock fish a lot. Uh, lower Bay less so, but still fish rock piles. Um, but Middle Bay, if you don't know what the Middle Bay is, Middle Bay is pretty much from, in my opinion, York River up to about the Maryland-Virginia line, so the Potomac. Um, you do have Pocosin in there, which could be classified Middle Bay, but that general area. I fished a lot of Mob Jack when I was younger. Um, Mob Jack Bay was my place, my happy place. I knew those fish like the back of my hand. I knew all those rivers like the back of my hand. Uh, when I moved down to live in Norfolk, Got to know the lower bay a whole lot better. Um, still fished lower bay when I was in the middle, when I fished the middle bay, but less so. Um, but I still fished a lot of oyster bars. This fly is deadly in oyster bars, um, which is part of why it doesn't live very long because, you know, you hit an oyster one too many times and you cut it off. So, speaking of that, let's talk about leaders on this guy. All my saltwater flies, it's pretty simple 0x, um, 16 pound. You know, if you're going to go with, you know, some predator leader. Uh, so that's what I fish. It's that simple. Um, and in fact, small mouth fishing, 0x. Large mouth fishing, 0x. Start fishing for trout, 0x. Um, if you haven't noticed, I've got a pretty easy theme. Um, I don't, I kind of learned to really pare down everything I own and get it to where I don't have 50 versions of everything just because it makes my life easier. Um, let's be honest here, where the fish that are hitting this don't care about leaders. They don't care. Um, but when you're gonna fish it, I'm gonna fish either a sinking line or a floating line. Um, and that's pretty much how it is. A floating line, I'm gonna use a nine foot zero X. A sinking line, really different. So sinking lines are awesome if you've got one. If you learn how to fish them, they're amazing. I love fishing zero. I love fishing my sinking lines. Um, for a long time, actually, I didn't even know how to really cast a floating line because I fish so much sinking. But a sinking line is, I'm going to take my zero, spool of zero X and I'm literally going to pull it out, have the spool 
you know, between these two fingers, pull it out, and I put it to this collarbone. That's literally how long my meter is, uh, about four feet. So you want to run a very short line leader with sinking line because when you think about it, sinking line is dropping. So if you've got a long leader, it's back here, and the fly is going to be, you know, even though it's got dumbbell eyes, it's still going to be higher up in the water column theoretically. Shorten up that leader. Now we've just gotten it down to here. So if you look, you know, there's the difference. Get that fly closer to the bottom, closer to where these fish live, closer to where this fly is supposed to be imitating something. And so it's called my croaker fly because the middle bay has got some croaker. Um, a lot of people don't know the world record actually came out of the middle bay. Eight pounds, 13 ounces. And I can tell you something, I've seen a mountain of it. It is the ugliest fish that has ever existed. Well, maybe not, but it's... It's a face only a mother can love. At the same time, I love catching croaker. Um, in my opinion, they should be called silver drum because they're a member of the drum family. They are related to a red drum. They're a close relative. And you know what? When you get them over a foot, get them over 18 inches, they will give a fight to anything. Um, I typically fish, fish the middle bay on a six or a seven weight, and oftentimes with hook a croaker or a red drum, that made me, that made the rod cry. Um, never broke a rod, luckily. At the same time, wrapped a few pilings because they ran back up into a dock or something and I uh, couldn't stop them. So that's the reason why a lot of times you'll hear me talk about, you know, hey, if you're gonna have one rod to go to salt water, rain ain't weight. That's why. Um, same reason why we talk about if you got one rod for fresh water, fish a five because, yeah, a little tiny brook trout isn't gonna do a whole lot for it. But at the same time, when you hang that 24 inch brown, you at least got something to slow them down. Um, you know, you take a three weight on a 24 inch brown, yeah, you can do it, but it's not gonna be fun. Um, you know, it's gonna be bad. I've, I've seen plenty of videos of it. So when I'm fishing this fly, like I said, I'm gonna fish it down near the bottom. I'm gonna strip it, but I'm gonna literally be stripping it like this. Very slowly kind of skittering it across the bottom. I want it to look like a shrimp that's kind of walking along the bottom, you know, maybe give it a little hop, you know, just a little hop to, oh, someone's behind me, I better run. That sort of thing, and that's why I think this fly is so dangerous, and it's why it works so well, because of the fact that it just looks like a little shrimp walking across the bottom. It looks like a shrimp that's out to lunch. Uh, so, you know, I've been talking about the Middle Bay. Like I said, I've fished it all up and down the East Coast, um, at least North Carolina, South Carolina. Fished it a lot. Uh, on the Outer Banks when I used to go there regularly. Um, living in Norfolk, I was down the Outer Banks regularly. It's an hour and a half ride. Quick, and, quick ride. Friends live down there. Hey, you want to go fish? Yeah. You know, give me, you know, be there tomorrow morning. So, fish this a lot. Um, when I fished down there, I did a lot around Oregon Inlet. That was kind of my home. Um, that was my home base. And I uh, got to know it pretty well. Fished around, you know, Hampton Roads. I fished, I went to ODU. So, if you live down in Hampton Roads, if you're from Hampton Roads chapter, you know about where I fished. Um, I didn't travel far from home. I, a lot of times, would roll out, you know, hey, I got like two hours between now and when I got to uh, get this assignment in. Let me quick run out and go catch on it. Um, I did a lot of that. So now let's get going. Um, I'm gonna tie this today, and I'll pull it out on the, uh, I'm gonna switch cameras. Oh, well, that's a hook now on the floor. Um, Remind me of that later, please, guys, because when I'm ready to finish, could somebody put in the notes, uh, you know, hey, Jeff, don't forget about the hook you dropped on the floor so I don't find it later the hard way. Um, give me a second. I'm actually going to switch camera views. Yep, we're now playing with multiple camera views tonight. So, all right. So, what do I have here? The Orvis, pretty sharp and saltwater hooks. I've got a size four. Um... Reality, if I could find my ones or twos, I would really like them. Can't find them. Um, don't know where I put them. Uh, might be out of them for all I know. So, hey, what do you know that works? Um, trying to run multiple screens up on a uh, computer, not always fun. Other thing that I got, um, some plain lead medium eyes. So 
Brian and I know talked about how he doesn't really like using lead. Eh, I don't blame him. Um, I don't remember where I got these. I'm guessing they're Wopsy, so I got them online somewhere. Um, that's not from one of our local shops, so it's probably one of those. I was putting in an order for other stuff, and hey, I need some dumbbell eyes. Um, and that's a big pack of them. That's going to last me a while. So, with this fly, these are mediums. These are going to be pretty big. So I would typically be putting mediums on a size 4 if I was planning on fishing this on a floating line. Um, I'd go to small, so I was fishing on a sinking line. That's kind of one of the things to think about is, uh, you know, you can vary your eye size on these to kind of match what you're trying to do. Um, you know, if you're going to be fishing and you only have floating line with you, it'll work, trust me. Um, it works, there are tons of fish caught on that. Just go to a slightly heavier eye, go to, you know, we talked about a 9 foot liter, maybe go to a 10 foot liter or an 11 foot liter. Um, you know, go pick up a 9 foot liter and add another, you know, 2, 3 feet onto it in 1x. You know, I said 0x, I had 1x, you know, that's like 13 pound test instead of 15. Um, it'll work. So, you know, let's be honest here, guys. You're fishing that heavy leader help protect from what the bottom is going to do to it. So I'm going to tie this tonight. First one I'm going to tie actually is going to be in olive, which is my favorite color. But I am going to use brown thread. <laughs> if you've been watching all these live streams, you know what thread this is. 210 denier flat waxed. So put our thread on. I'll wait for anybody to catch up who is trying to tie along. And guys, like I said, this is a quick fly, so this probably won't even be an hour tonight. Um, if I do two of them, it shouldn't be an hour. This is a pretty quick fly. It's what I like. Um, so, you're going to want to put this. I put it about where you normally put clouser eyes. So, normally where you put your dumbbell eyes, Chuck Craft always likes to put his eyes up in the front. This is not a Chuck Craft fly. This is closer to a Bob Clouser style fly. So I'm going to put it back here. I'm going to put it about that third of the way back. Um, wish I had remembered. I was actually going to show you guys a pretty cool trick uh, that Chuck had taught me. Um, if you ever wanted to have more weight but less sink rate, which I know seems a little odd, but, you know, hey. Um, I'll just describe it to you. What Chuck would do is he would tie these in Add the eyes in, and then quite literally take a pair of pliers, of heavy duty pliers, and crush these dumbbells. That's one of the reasons why he liked lead, was that he could literally crush them. And he would flatten it out, it would make it kind of planer, um, kind of flat. And he always told me that that would make the fly, you know, kind of flutter down slower, but still have the weight. I don't know, there are times I wonder when he told me that, you know, if he's looking down on me right now saying this laughing, going, yeah, that fool, he believed everything I told him, um, <laughs> would not shock me. Um, love Chuck, miss Chuck. So, now we're just going to tie back to the bend of the hook. So, bend of this hook is right about, right where the barb is or so, um, you know, in this particular hook design. Every hook design is a little bit different. Um, you know, I've got a lot of the Orvis hooks because of my past. I, you know, don't have a particular brand that I'm loyal to. Um, for me, I mean, I like the Gamagatsu B10S, but that's because that's a B10S. Uh, that's a very specific hook. But for saltwater hooks, Mustad 34007. Um, I don't know what they call the new one, the new version of it. Um, I know their signature series, and those signature series hooks are awesome. The old 3407s were lackluster in a lot of places. Um, they came pre dulled for you, uh, you know, to help keep from getting the hook in your finger. Um, they also had a tendency to bend really quickly. I've got more than a few friends. I'm lucky I never had it happen to me on a fish. I have plenty of rocks and whatnot, I've had them bend straight. I've, I've had, had a few friends, friends who've lost big fish, fish to them because, because that 3407 bent straight on them. Um, yes, yes, it does happen. happen. You know, it's a fact of life. 
So now, now we're going to take our SS, just plain old SS. And guys, I know you're seeing a little bit of a breakup. I don't know what just happened there. Um, not sure what was going on with my camera. So typically, I'm going to try to pull some of this fuzz out so I get down to that inner core. Um, if you look, if there's the inner core, tie this in. I don't think I've ever showed you guys this fly, honestly. I'm trying to think back. Steve, Rick, you might, you might remember if I've ever done this fly before. It would have been the early years of this chapter. But now I just tied in, sitting off the back. Now I'm going to rotate up to the front. Now I'm going to take my hand. Yes, I have a rotary vise. Yes, I could be rotating. I don't. Um, and I'm going to do this with touching wraps. So I want this fairly thick. If you look, this is a pretty thick SS. Um, this is plain old generic SS, nothing special. So now that I'm up right behind the eye of the hook, I'm actually going to do a wrap. And if you look, and I don't know if you can really see it, I just wrapped over the eye of the hook. I do it because I think it looks good. Yeah, I got a weird thing going on tonight. So, put a couple of wraps down. So, here's where one of the weird things with this fly, this is where I think I was being told otherwise. Um, this is where I think I made a mistake on the design from somebody else. Normally, you can flip the fly over, put your wing on this way. Instead, I am actually flipping the fly over and I'm going to put the wing on this way. So this is not normal. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing is I've got a chartreuse bucktail, but you're tying an olive, you say. I am, but I'm going to use a different part of the bucktail than what we typically talk about. Um, I know you guys have heard about my buddy Tommy who literally will cut out all of this, you know, all of the backside here. I don't, and I've always said there's a reason, there's a specific fly that I tie with this. Um, and this is what it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a pinch. In reality, I don't want a big pinch. I want, you know, maybe a standard clump for, you know, your clouser. You know, a light clump for a clouser kind of size pinch. Um, now, if you also notice, I'm not pulling from the very bottom. Very bottom is hollow. Um, that is hollow hair that will totally flare on you. Ooh, I hate the hollow hair. Um, that is hair that I will cut out. But this, I'm just going to go ahead, trim it out. I won't even stack it. What I'm just going to do, I'm going to take it, flip it to the other hand, I'm going to pull out all the shorts. Now, from here, I'm going to kind of size this up a little bit. This, because it's a size 4, it's a smaller, it's on the smaller end of what I typically fish this fly. It's going to be something like this. So what I want is for it to go a little bit beyond the back of the hook. And I know I'm getting people kind of questioning what is he doing, has he lost his mind? Well, that's entirely possible. Um, it is COVID-19 era, you know, it's possible. So, then I'm going to trim out the extra. Now, you know how oftentimes I'll start out by trimming out that extra? Uh, this time I didn't. So, next thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to wrap underneath. If you look, I'm going underneath, and I'm literally just wrapping right behind the eye. Okay. Doing a couple wraps there. Just trying to make it, you know, kind of bulletproof for a fly that's designed to last for 10 minutes. Um, and then what I'm just doing 
kind of stroking a lot of the stuff back. I'm going to create a little bit ahead. So, if you look, man, that head looks ugly from this angle. Looks pretty mild. Um, yeah, it is what it is. So, kind of, kind of love how this camera looks. Carver is calling me. So, with this, just gonna sit here, do a whip finish. I said this was a quick fly. Um, now I didn't talk about color much. I like natural colors. We've gone over this many times in all these sealing water events. So I am gonna take this and trim it up a little bit up here because what's funny is it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look bad when I looked at it, but man, in the camera it looked horrible. Normally I wouldn't even worry about this because again, this fly is designed to live long. Now I'm gonna take Shocker. Hey look, it's actually not crazy glue. Um, head cement. I'm using Sally Hansen's part of the nails because that's what I have. Looking at it, it's starting to yellow, so I'm guessing that I'm, it's about time for me to get some new part of the nails. And what I'm doing, if you look, I'm kind of trying to go over top of this whole head. Now, I did tie an olive fly and I did use brown thread. Eh. That really doesn't make much of a difference to me. So what we're looking like, you know, if you look at this fly, how it's going to go underneath the water, it's going to be going like this. Hook point up, theoretically, it's got enough weight on it, it will be hook pointed up. And it's basically just going to go skitter across that bottom. The tail, these back fibers look like either antennae or legs or something like that. Um, I talked about, you know, in materials and option, of uh, something like uh, crab eyes, they'd be coming out the back, or a little bit of um, flashaboo, or something like that, or krennic. Um, yeah, that's actually one that I have done. Um, so kind of funny story. If you remember, you know, if you remember back the orange shops, Tommy Manuel used to tie what he called his redfish fly. And if you remember that fly, it looks a lot like this. Might be a story behind that one. Um, Tommy says he didn't do it. I sold it, he stole it from me. Um, kind of funny how we went out on a trip out in the bay, beat up on some croaker on one of the, uh, on one of the flats out there. He saw what I was fishing, and magically a couple weeks later it showed up in my shop. Slightly modified, you, could, you know, but, and he, you know, he said, he's like, you guys want to try this? And I mean, I told him to buy it, and they did. Um, that was back before I was, a, before I was running the show. Um, and I mean, it was a great fly, absolutely deadly, saving me from having to tie for a shop. But if you look at this fly, it's pretty simple, um, pretty basic, and like I said, it's kind of ugly. Um, this fly is intended to be ugly. This fly is not intended to be your pretty dry fly. It's intended to be your, you know, Ah, yes, that's actually a pretty good one, too. Um, so, but yeah, no, of all the things, you know, I miss, I miss my mind the most. Yeah, now, now that's running through my head, thanks, too. But yeah, um, where was I with this? But yeah, with this fly, it's not intended to be a pretty dry fly. It's not intended to be an Adams. It's not intended to be, you know, this perfect clouser or this perfect deceiver, you know, it's not intended to be perfect. It's intended to be ugly. It's intended to be a box filler. It's intended to catch fish. And, you know, in the world of going out in salt water, let's see even bluefish. Um, this fly literally cat live about two cats to, in bluefish. Um, not that there's really a whole lot you can do to make a fly more bluefish, you know, capable. Um, we, we talk about using a longer shank hook and tying at the back of it. Um, Brian talked about that. Uh, using something like this. It's a size one. So we can tie this whole fly on this back section. But at the same time, that's not really going to stop the bluefish from just chewing its part to pieces. Um, my favorite bluefish fly that survived the longest 
truly was just some feathers tied to a hook. Um, so, you know, it literally was four, you know, saddle hackles tied to a hook because of the fact that it didn't live very long. It was four saddle hackles, which cost me about a penny to two pennies. You know, if I got the hook back, awesome, and uh, some thread, and it took me about a minute and a half to tie. So, from there, why don't we try doing another one? This time, let's try it up. Uh, let's tie this one up in a less natural color. We're going to go with chartreuse. I am going to use the same bucktail, um, but I'm going to actually go with the actually normal side of the bucktail for this. Um, or not, depending on how I feel in the moment. So I'm going to tie this one up. I'm actually going to change out the price. I did not come prepared this time. And this thread does not go through my bobbins very well. So, kind of I feel like this is my first, uh, first time doing one of these things like we did four months ago. Actually, you guys want to have some fun, go back and watch some of our old ones. And we've done it and how we've changed. So, switched over, uni thread, 3 aught. so this is a heavy duty thread. Again, you know, we're just trying to tie up, and I'm going to tie this one up on another big hook. We're going to tie this one up big, and I... Where is my flash of boo? Yeah, well, nothing within reach. I'm going to tie this up on a big hook. This is a size 1 Mustad. But, this is an O'Shaughnessy. What makes it that? A size 4 to a size 1 should not be a massive difference in hook shank length. Um, and this is one of those things that we don't really talk a whole lot about. This is a one at this hook, which I showed a minute ago. Let's see if I can get this to actually, well, I don't know why I'm trying to get it to focus. It's not going to, it's locked. It's a 1x long, 2x heavy duty, so it's a heavy hook. Um, this guy is good, strong hook. Definitely wouldn't be afraid to put this thing in front of a bull drum, um, bull red drum into something like that. But it's a 1x long, so it's a longer shanked hook. Should be ending about right here or so. Um, well, actually there. Usually it's about a hook eye. Each X is typically about a hook eye length. Um, so basically if you think about a size 2, 2X long is about equivalent within a few hundredths of an inch to a size 4, 4X long. Um, little pro tip. They're very similar. The difference is going to be that hook gap. And, you know, we talk about hook gap being important on bass. It is. Um, it definitely is on bass. It definitely is in a lot of situations. Um, trout is less so. At least tradition says that. So let's get started tying. So, tie in your thread. I don't know where I put down my dumbbell eyes. So, and guys, by the way, also you notice that this is a shocker. We're not actually using foam in this fly. Um, I think this is the first fly I've tied in a while that didn't involve foam somewhere hidden, even if it was hidden somewhere in it. Um, so don't worry, foam will be coming back. So just give me a few weeks. So I kind of wanted to, since everyone is starting, still doing some beach vacations, I did want to do a saltwater fly. Um, at the same time, you know, I this thing could be thrown to common carp in the Rivanna. Uh, it is a little bit crayfishy, so why not? So we're gonna tie on. I'm gonna use the same size dumbbell eyes. Look at how tiny these eyes look on this big giant hook. So, if you notice when I tie on, one thing I do is I do my figure eight wraps like we all do. Then I do wraps literally going around that thread base. And what that does is that locks that in. 
Um, some people will grab super glue to do that. I can't cut the dumbbells off if for some reason I need to save the hook for something um, if I do that. So use a good strong thread, do that kind of circle wrap, you'll lock in. Um, as long as you're using a strong enough thread and using enough thread tension, you'll be fine. So now we're going to wrap to the bottom and we want to cover up the entire hook shank with this. So I didn't talk about that last time because the particular s I was using was pretty opaque. Um, didn't allow a whole lot of light through. Ooh, did anybody else catch that? Uh oh, I hit, I hit a hook point. This is another reason why we like to use a uh, 3 out thread and heavy duty threads. If that was uh, like an 8 out or a 10 out, I'd be retying a thread on. So, with this particular pattern, this particular S says, and one thing is, guys, is the amount of light that I've got coming down, you can't see kind of how opaque or not opaque things are. Um, I have upgraded my lighting. I'm not quite Brian's level, but I have upgraded my lighting from the last time I did one of these. Um, you know, it's one of those things I've been doing is slowly adding some toys in. So now we're going to tie in our SS. So pick whatever color SS you want to use. Um, I have used pink before. Hot pink, apparently. I have used a standard, like, opal, clear, pearl, whatever you want to call this. Um, obviously, browns, olives. Um, I got a little baggie right here of more Estazes. This, uh, the UV one is actually going to be the lighter color. Um, if you see, the reason why they call it UV is see how it's got multiple colors kind of shimmering through it? That's why it's called UV, because um, the way it reflects... So tie it up in multiple colors, you know, multiple colors. If you're going to pick one size, I'd go with size two. Um, if you're going to pick, you know, if you can tie up multiple sizes, cool, awesome. Um, one to four. So we're not trying to imitate a big giant uh, shrimp. So what we're trying to imitate is a smaller shrimp, something that, you know, a redfish or a speckled trout or a croaker or a black drum or a striper or even a ray might be swimming along and go, ooh, tasty morsel. Um, think about it that way. So this one I am going to do the uh, rotary feature on my vise. I don't have the handy dandy little end piece um, so I can keep my thread from wrapping. So I'm going to have to kind of cheat to do that. And I'll show you guys a little trick on that. So now we're going to wrap this in. And here's the trick. Unwrap. I know. I, I know. I'm a genius. It's a, it's a gift. So, come underneath. Do another wrap or two towards the front. And then wrap. This is not working because I've got a mile brand spanking new pack of SS. And I don't do Brian's little trick of cutting a hole in the side of it. Kind of wished I did. Honestly, I've lost the packaging for this one. No idea where. Um, absolutely no idea. If anybody ever has seen pictures of my old fly tying desk when I was in Charlottesville, you'd know where it probably went. Um, it's probably still buried in there, and I haven't lived in that apartment in how many years? So now we're just going to basically try to work this material back a little bit. Clean up that eye a little bit. So, now... We're going to take, and you know what, I'm actually going to do this with a slight kind of difference on it. I'm going to use this backside again. Um, like I said, I like these a little bit, I like this 
because of the fact that, and it is a property, if you look on the deer hair, if you can find the good stuff, and by the way, this one we are going to want to have a bit bigger of a, ooh, that's a lot of hair coming out, a bit bigger of a patch. You know, bigger fly, you do want a slightly bigger hatch. Um, it's all about proportion. It's one thing to fly tying. It is all about proportion in your eye. You know, that's one of the learning things with fly tying that takes many years um, to learn. If you don't have it right immediately, it's fine. You're not a bad person. So now I'm going to do this, kind of check it. I'm going to trim this one just a little bit first because I'm in the mood to do that. If you guys can hear a fan in the background, it's my AC. Um, if anybody hasn't noticed, it's really hot outside. Um, I don't know if my AC is turned off at all today. So. Just doing the first one, see how it's all sitting up. Come down below, put a couple wraps behind the head. Cool thing you get, if you look, it's almost like a little bit of a shell back too. Um, so when you think about tying up like stonefly patterns, or uh, the prince nymph, or actually even a hare's ear. <coughs> Wouldn't be a healing waters event without me coughing you have got a shell back here. That is something, do I think that it makes a difference? I don't know, honestly, I don't know. But I like it, so you know what? And if I like it, I'm more likely to put it on, uh, more likely to tie it onto the hook, or tie it onto the leader. And if I'm more likely to tie it on the leader, I'm more likely to fish it. And if I'm not fishing it, what's the point of it? So now we're just gonna take it, Come back up to the front, do our couple of wraps, create a head. And guys, we will be doing some trout flies coming up. Um, honestly, with the temperatures being the way that they are, we don't feel that anybody should be trout fishing. I've been hearing some reports, Mossy Creek is still okay. Um, definitely the brook trout streams are hurting bad. Those fish are hurting. Um, you know, I know in Richmond we've been over 100 almost every day. Uh, today was 101. So, you know, and I know up in the mountains it's 90. 90 is bad for trout, um, unfortunately. So, that's why we're, that's the main reason why lately we've been pausing on doing any trout flies. I would like to do a few. Um, I know we've got some people who've requested them. That also is something. If you've got a request, please feel free to reach out um, to either Brian <coughs> or I. Um, this was actually requested by uh, somebody who's actually on. Wanted to know something for going out and fishing, you know, the Outer Banks. So. We need some help with uh, some ideas. Sometimes, you know, question as simple as that. Hey, what do I use for this? Jog our memories of, hey, we haven't tried this yet. Um, so in order to contact me, pretty simple. It's J, you can email me. <coughs> Let me grab some water, because it yep, wouldn't be healing waters. Um, my email is jgreendike at gmail.com. So it's J-G-R-E-E-N-D-Y-K at gmail.com. Um, I check my email regularly. That's my personal email that is, so I am always available on it. But if you got an idea, shoot it. You know, if you got a question, send it over. Um, you know, I don't think we're gonna be doing another one of those round tables anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, questions can lead to ideas and things that Brian and I can help out with. Because doesn't look like we're gonna be doing any, you know, events, especially, you know, sounds to me like there was no, you know, inside tying for a long time. Um, I haven't heard anything about outside events. 
Unfortunately, I was talking to John last night, and I totally forgot to ask him. Um, meant to do it, but totally forgot. So, you know, hopefully we can get together at some point in the near future. Uh, just with the way things are going, I don't know how that's going to go. Um, we've all kind of been looking at that. So, you know, with this fly, I'll talk about, you know, kind of the way you fish it again. I'm going to try to get it. I'm actually going to zoom out. See if this actually works. Hey, look, everyone can see me. Um, so this fly is going to sit on the bottom. Let's pretend that this, this kind of area is the bottom. This fly is going to go boom, 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 boom. And you kind of want it to do that. You want it to kind of drag, jump, kind of a thing. You'll know when you get a fish, and you actually you can generally actually identify species of fish. Um, it takes a little bit of practice, but a croaker will go tap, 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 you know, and then all of a sudden grab. That's them actually quite literally biting up the back of the fly. <coughs> now, flounder. I didn't talk about you can catch flounder on this, but uh, yeah, you can catch flounder on it. They are a tap, tap, grab. That's how they operate. Um, redfish are a whoop, grab it. Uh, stripers literally inhale. They're, they're related. Well, they're not really related to a bass, but they're like a bass. Um, and I realized I wasn't looking at the camera. Sorry, guys. I'm looking at my screen. So bass are going to go ahead and inhale it. You know, you get into everything, you know, you can kind of sometimes tell. Um, when you've had a good day and you've caught a bunch of fish, you can start identifying. And I used to do it regularly. We'd uh, have bets. We'd set the hook on what it was. Um, that was back when we got to fish this stuff quite a bit. But, you know, this fly designed it for salt water, fished it in salt water for years. Um, it's a fun fly. It's a quick fly. I mean, we've done two with me just blabbering and telling you how to fish it and everything in 43 minutes. Um, honestly, if you sit down, tie up a few, you'll get it down to a few minutes of fly. But, like I said, this fly, don't be afraid to throw it into tight cover, into stuff where you might not get it back. Now, that is the one problem with fishing Zero X. It doesn't break very easily. Um, you know, it, it ain't 5X. It, it takes some effort to break. But that's part of the game um, because at the same time you want to be in that situation. When we're fishing in salt water, I don't think I've ever really talked about it with you guys. You know, those fish we see on TV, you know, oh, they're fishing the flats, they're fishing the flats. That's not everything and that's definitely not what we get. Um, our fish like cover, they like structure. So when you think about most salt water situations, all salt water is the river that changes direction twice a day. That's all it is. So, you know, when you're fishing somewhere and you happen to find oysters, think about these edges of those oyster bars. Because oyster bars are going to build up sand and build up, and they're going to be higher than the rest of the area. So it's going to be like a little, you know, a little plateau. Well, along those edges, those fish are waiting for bait fish to be washed over the oyster bar. And then when they're going over, they'll be sitting on the backside of it and go, bait fish, whoop, and grab it. Not that uncommon. That is actually kind of your typical place they're going to go find fish. Other thing is obviously docks. I mean, come on, they break, they break the everything up. They attract bait fish. They're awesome. Um, you know, rock piles. Again, you know, oyster bars are going to generally fish. Think about it the way you fish trout with a big rock in the middle of the river. You know, yeah, some, you know, the more active ones are going to be on the front side of it. The less active ones are going to be on the back side of it. That doesn't mean you don't fish the back side. Um, you know, now do you attack it the way you attack on a trout stream from bottom, you know, from back side up? No, they're not quite like that. Um, most of the water fish are not that spooky. But, you know, stuff, stuff like that. But you're going to want to throw flies like this. Or a clouser minnow. I always laugh at this. You know, people would always ask me, you know, what should I throw in salt water on my clouser minnow? Um, when in doubt, just put it on a clouser. But something like this, put it into structure. Um, if you're fishing on a sand flat, just bounce it across the bottom. But you want to fish it, you know, kind of somewhere near something for fish to go run to. Because a lot of these fish, you know, croaker, 
smaller reds, like rat reds, like we call them rat reds. They're uh, usually reds up to about 12 inches, you know, um, 12 to 12 to 24 is considered a puppy drum. Um, yeah, they're, these are not hard and fast rules. Do not quote me on these, but these are kind of mine. Um, beyond 24 is a redfish. Beyond 36 is a, is a bull. Um, but you know, these fish, when they're smaller, they're bait. You know, you think, you know, I don't care. It's 12 inches long. It's bait to something else, especially in salt water. Um, you know, I've seen sharks in salt water. They exist. I've seen big ones. Um, get into shallow water. You know, 36 inch red is bait to an eight foot shark. But don't see those very often, um, luckily. So only ever seen that once, an eight footer in shallow water. That was on the eastern shore of Virginia. So it's kind of sharky territory. But something like this, go out there, fish it on Zero X. I talked about sinking lines, if you've got them, fish them, four foot leaders. Uh, floating lines, you know, Floating lines, we're going to go heavier or longer leader, um, but both of them, I'm going to fish earwax. Uh, simple as that. It's, it's easy. Um, we all can pick up zero X in any fly shop. You know, if you walk into a fly shop, they don't have zero X. Yeah, go find another fly shop. Um, unless they're out for some reason, in which case then, you know, that's totally acceptable that they have sold through all their materials because, hey, business is good and that's a good thing. That means that's a shop you probably do want to be at. So, all right, guys. Well, um, I think I'm going to call that for tonight. Like I said, this is probably going to be a short one. And hopefully we'll be able to see everybody. And hope everybody has a great day. I'm not sure what we're going to do next. Brian and I have decided we're probably going to keep doing this every other week thing um, through the month of August. At least that's what our decision was as of a week ago. But... Not sure what he's thinking about to do um, for a fly. We haven't talked about that. So hope everyone has a great day. I hope everyone stays safe out there. Um, stay cool and have a great day. Have a good one, guys. Bye.